Can't you hear me here? Hello. Um, so I, um, since yesterday, apparently, without knowing, um, I sang a verse from the, the psalm for Monday. Um, I thought that today um, we could look at a verse, a phrase from the psalm for Tuesday and see the resonance um, with it and a verse in Psalm 9. So uh, just uh, if anyone's got Psalm 9 in front of them, they'll see that in verse 20 it says, Kuma Adonai, rise Adonai, let not men have power, let the nations be judged by your presence. And in Psalm uh, 80, 82, verse 8, it says, Arise, God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your possession. So really um, strong, clear connection in theme there. And today's Tuesday, and it happens to be a verse from the, the psalm for, for Tuesday. So do we have it? We have it up. Great. All right. So this is a simple chant by Shefa Gold. Um, and also this melody, it, the simplicity of it really reminds me a lot of the melody for Elitzion, which we're associating with this season as well. Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Shafta Aretz, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Shafta Aretz, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Shafta Aretz, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Shafta Aretz. Harold, could you leave those words up for a second? So thank you so much for that, Jacob. Really beautiful. And uh, Chef is one of my favorites. And she does a lot with this chanting and encourages us to sing things not once or twice, but for several minutes. And this is a great example of it. So I just want to look at the Hebrew here for a moment um, uh, because so much of it, I hope is starting to get a little bit familiar. Beginning, first of all, with the word kuma. We've seen that a few times uh, in the, to, as a, a command to God. Imagine the chutzpah of this, right? This is, a chutz, this is a chutzpah dick thing to do, and the Psalms do this a lot. Kuma Adonai, kuma Elohim, get up. So that, let's just look at that for the Hebrew for a second. Kuma, what the shoresh, the root of kuma is kuf, Probably Yud, Mem, Lakum could be above. There's a, again, those are weak letters, so they switch back and forth. But Lakum is the show, is the infinitive. Kuma, get up. This is uh, uh, this is exhorting God to get up. This is telling God arise up, as if God is not needs us to tell God we need God's presence. Get up, rise up. We see this over and over again. By the way, it's addressed to us in L'chad Dodi, this same Shoresh, to get up, to wake up, to be, to stand up, to be, uh, to be awake, to be up. Shafta Haaretz. So there in the, so the, the third word there has the Shin Pei Tet Shoresh, which we've seen over and over again, a very important Shoresh, which means uh, in some way the Shoresh has to do with judgment, or a judge as a noun, it could mean a judge, a shofet is a judge. Beta mishpat is a court. Mishpat is a sentence that a court can issue, or mishpat is a law. So that shoresh, which always means something with justice or judging, but not in a judgy, the way we say judgy in English, in a sense where there's actual justice, where there's a judge who's doing the thing which needs to be done, which is calling balls and strikes, so to speak, calling things right or wrong. Now, you'll notice here, just to make a quick back to our Beged Kefet, pay is one of the word letters that will get a dagesh if it's at the beginning of a word or the beginning of a syllable. So there, shaf 
It's not at the beginning of a word or the beginning of the syllable. It ends the syllable of shaf. So therefore, there's no dagesh. So it's not pronounced shap ta, which in fact, if you tried to even say it, it's harder to say. Shap ta is harder to say than shaf ta. So this is why we see there's no dagesh in the pay here. But sometimes the, that shoresh will have a pay like, um, but shaf ta, but mishpat, beta mishpat, it's the same shoresh, but because it's not following an open syllable and it's at the beginning of a syllable itself, the pay in mishpat is a pay, not a fe. But here it's a fe, no dagesh, but the exact same shoresh. And the a uh, ending, shafta, is here, judge, is in, a, is in the verb form. Hen ha-aretz. Ha, some of you have probably come across in your class study. Ha is a prefix, which means the. And ha-aretz means the land. So ha is very, very important. The, as a definitive article, <laughs> is a very important part of grammar. And in Hebrew, the definitive article is not a separate word like we have in English, the. It's part of the word it is attached to. And sometimes the hey itself disappears and the ah. So for instance, if we had, instead of a hey, we had a lamed here. And I know Kita Aleph has learned the lamed so far. If this said la aretz, the lamed would be for the, uh, for the preposition to but the a ah would be from the definitive article ha, ha. So la is a combination of li plus ha means la. And we combine the, the vowel from ha and the consonant from li, and then you would have la aretz, to the land. So la would actually mean to the. So aretz, now this is one last thing about this. The word in Hebrew is actually Eretz, right? Eretz, Zavat, Chalav, Udvash, a land full of milk and honey. The Hebrew word is Eretz, but here it has the vowel underneath, a kamatz, instead of two, and I don't know who's on this, who's been studying this, and two, instead of two segols, it has a kamatz, that little T under the Aleph. So this is when segolit nouns, okay, here we go. We're getting so geeky here. Segolit nouns are nouns that have eh, eh, like gefen, eretz. When those two words for famous examples in Sidor Hebrew or in biblical Hebrew are at the end of a phrase, or we call them in geeky grammar language, a pausal form meaning they're either at the etnachta, the big semicolon, the middle of the phrase, or they're at a sof pasuk, the end of a sentence. So in other words, pausal, we're, we're, com we're coming to an end of a phrase or a sentence, it turns to aret. So like we say, for instance, bore peri ha, do we say gefen? No, we say bore peri ha gafen. It's the same thing as this ha-aretz. Eretz is actually the noun, but it changes to ha'aretz. So we say bore peri ha gafen. We don't say bore peri ha gafen when we say the blessing over wine. And uh, so that's a very interesting little geeky grammatical tip for everybody. So this is called a segolet noun, but ha'aretz because it's pausal. But now you know the etnachta, which is the big semicolon at the end of the phrase means we say aretz, not eretz. Gafen, not gefen. Bore peri ha gafen. Amotzi lechem ha, what do we say for motzi? We don't say hamotzi lechem ha eretz, which is actually the noun is eretz. We say hamotzi lechem ha aretz. It changes because it's the end of a sentence. Okay, enough Hebrew grammar for today. All right, how about some art, which some visual art, which is uh, inspired by the Psalms, brought to us once again by Noreen Dean Dresser. Let me open Noreen's offerings. File open. 
Noreen, are you here? I am. Okay. Let me show, would you like the, let's show the whole thing first. Hold on. Show the whole thing we'll, first. I, I say this for everyone, but I think that this one is now my favorite. Very powerful. <laughs> All right, here we are. Can you say, everyone can see this? Wow. Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay. I'll let you guys all take it in. Let me know. Wow. Talk to us about, seems like the battle at the end of the world here. Well, this psalm really, um, Psalm 9 came to me um, as really a confrontation uh, with evil. And um, it's, there are parts of the song, as you know, and you'll see that in the details where it really is, you know, erase them, erase them forever. Um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not going back to the song, but I mean, in the sense of, um, you know, there was a clear confrontation. What you can see in this is in the upper left, what would be to the upper left hand corner, you can see in our, as I always say, our, our one match with the head. Um, he always has some, our, uh, the speaker always has a little battle scars on him, but his wow. head's not been ignited. And so he's the one always in the center there, you can see him address uh, is our speaker for the song. And um, that's consistent throughout all of these. And then you can see um, the good people from each nation. You will see these whole matches kind of coming towards him. And you can see, uh, if you look carefully, you will find them. There's a few that are making their way to follow him um, into the, um, you know, to the goddess judge who is on high and then sweeps is the you know is the light um um so then you can go to the detail if you can i think i Carol, can. here we are you can get a close-up i'm trying to figure yeah. out how to do this yeah show a detail can you see it i think people are ready yes okay yes, there it is this is the lower right hand corner and you can really see where they're going to be a race so as the matches are being burned, ignited in their own pit. They fall through the pits. And if you've seen the lower left-hand corner, also my gold, uh, my copper nails, they are, you know, as I said, I took that from Deuteronomy and into the, I um, mean, the instruction, excuse, the, inst the instruction by God to Moses to make, for Aaron to have a copper basin to wash his face before he faced God. So I like these copper nails as that kind of continued commitment. But the fire has burnt, you know, God is there and overseeing this and then they're, you know, whatever we, um, falling into the abyss. So you can see the shadows where they're just going to be annihilated. And there's various stages of drawing that bring that about. Uh, so, can you quick, yeah, the second detail very quickly, Errol, I don't want to take up people's time here. Just okay, what? this is spectacular, Dean, spectacular. Um, on these three, you can see our speaker, as I identify him. Um, the second match, which is in the middle, that is white, that is following towards the speaker, in the middle, Harold, above the pit, yeah, he's moving, to, that is that soul that is you know, person who is moving towards hearing the word, hearing God, moving towards it over these folks who are going in the other direction. And then the third one down there, which is at the bottom next to the copper nail here, I wanted you, if you could see it, it's too bad, but that is totally drawn by fire, uh -huh. that level of detail. So they're... Um, you can't capture is these are totally transformational in that the materials are turning over on themselves um going from graphite pencil into the ethereal back into the you know, do you know what i would love i would love like a video of your doings 
Well, I've promised to go up to Dean's and do a video with her. We just Although, have- Wouldn't that be fantastic? Nothing. I'd love to see kind of the artist doing the process. It's so spectacular. And I find the shading, and I really can't wait to see them in person because I know this is inadequate to get to the colors and the shading and the, you know, the texture. It's flattened a bit, obviously, by, the, by seeing it through uh, a computer screen. But I just love it. I find it so powerful and so capturing this, the tension and the struggle and the beauty of it, really beautiful. Dean, I, I think yeah. it reminded me of something. It reminds me of Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel on the wall, not the ceiling, with the poor souls at the bottom who are uh, wow. inside the hell falling into there. Yeah. And then this one, the hero uh, match, sort of sitting at the place where God sits in the Last, ju in the last Judgment, judging those who will rise to heaven and those who will yeah. fall to hell. And with these, these matches, as you said, rising up. Yes. Wow. So you, so Jean, you-, you I wanna say this, this is the, yeah. So you sketch in the match. Well, I just wanted to share it. Yeah, that's what I wanna see. I wanna see a video of this oh. in action. Oh. Uh, these are all hand drawn. Every match on there is hand drawn by yours truly. Um, but I also wanted to say that, and this is important for me, is two things. Well, there's two things I wanted to share with the group. One is that in the study of becoming an artist, and I know Rabbi, you talked about, I was very moved by you talking about your encounter with color and oil paint. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, um, I think that you, you really pay attention and that it, it's really about learning to pay attention. Yes. And that, um, that in drawing anything, the light is never the same. Yeah. That you really understand in the discipline of becoming an artist, the, tr the constant, the only ch constant is change itself. Yeah. And that God, um, I call it God, but in that universe of divine consciousness, um, it is constantly in transformation, that the creation is always unfolding. And um, I am extraordinarily humbled by that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that this has been really exploratory for me and I wanna to write to the Jewish Museum in that, as I've said, I love the illuminated manuscripts of the, Kel the Book of Kells and other things and having um, I also have been reading the Jewish museums and, and the history of those and the setup of those. I'm really interested in making these be Jewish drawings in the tradition of illuminated manuscripts and have them be Jewish. So I've been very careful about not having Christian iconography uh -huh. transgress into this, but really stay with, you know, Buber and Jewish concepts. So, uh -huh. you know, that's nice. Wow. All right, let's go to Magnificent. some of our text offerings. Let's see who we have up. By the way, Harold, did you get the email from Menachem Creditor about the second yes. volume which is coming out? Yes, I did. Oh, I did. It's in those that. vital emails to answer when I have the one minute that I yeah. But yes, I did. Yes, I did. So let's see. Uh, let's go to our text. Hold on. Um, and let's see, we went through Robin and Sherry yesterday and Michael, and I think we're on Donna, if Donna is with us today. Donna, are you here today? Here, yes. Okay, make this a little bigger, okay. and it is all yours. Dear God, it's Donna again. Just checking to make sure you got my first letter. I know you must be very busy taking care of the universe and performing miracles, but I need to hear from you. My praise for you has been echoing in the void. For months now, I've been fleeing from the coronavirus and the enemy is still out there, tailing me when I look back over my shoulder, gaining ground in my psyche. Older and at risk, I barricade myself behind apartment walls. It's hard to remember what it felt like to move about freely, to hug a friend, to breathe and sing together. People who do that in 
pre-plague movies or like aliens from a distant planet. How liberated they seem in their trust of the air. Friends across the ocean tell me life is almost back to normal there. Thanks to the godsend of strong, consistent leadership, disaster was averted. Here, a fool spreads confusion as the enemy surges. Superman's delusion of truth, justice, and the American way, unmasked as lies and injustice. May evil's legacy be cursed into oblivion like a bad TV show. But that's for some future time. For now, and for who knows how long, the battle rages on. And to know what, how to know what to do when everything is a risk. I do know that despair is not an option. My rabbi says so all the time, and I believe her. But sometimes the enemy's fearful army gains entry into my head. Then I'm fighting on two fronts, inside and out. I need a booster shot. Please help me, God. Help me to find you inside myself. A chant posted at a New York City bus stop read, what do we want? External validation. When do we want it? All the time. Funny and true. Please help me to strengthen the reinforcements of internal validation so that my path forward will be guided by your light. Help me to find a Sukkot Shalom. As Elul approaches, I try to sing my solo Ahatcha Alti and set my intention. One thing I ask of you, God, only this do I seek, to dwell in God's house all the days of my life, to behold your kindness, the loving kindness of God, and to meditate in God's sanctuary. The enemy may be everywhere, but let me find refuge in God's house. Let me rest in the peace of your protection, in the security of knowing that you are always there. For this, I pray. Thank you for hearing me, God, with gratitude and eternal praise. Rabbi, I think you're muted. Sorry, fabulous, Donna. Tell us a little bit of how you got from Psalm 9 to this. Give us a little bit of an insight into your process. Well, when, you know, it was talking about, um, you know, the enemy and confronting the enemy. And I thought, what enemy am I confronting? Uh -huh. I'm that confronting. That is a profound question, yeah. I'm confronting, well, I'm confronting actually multiple enemies. There's the... Um, the coronavirus, there are, you know, there's our foolish leader who is um, empowering an army of naysayers to deny it and empower it. Um, and then, you know, there's what happens inside of me. Yeah. You know, that, you know, it gains ground in my psyche when the longer this goes on, you know, I'm just trying to keep my head above water, you know? And I, I just love the shape of this, that you're doing this as a letter to God, which is for sure deep inside the Psalms. Some of these Psalms are so much directed in that second person, you. And that's what you're doing by, by putting it into a letter form. Very beautiful. And I think carrying that answer to the question of who are my enemies and to be able to carry both at once and say they're, they are external, but they're also internal. Just because they are external doesn't mean there aren't also internal. And just because there are internal doesn't mean there aren't also external. And sometimes we, th we get to the place of saying it's one or the other. And this is a very profound and beautiful expression of the, you know what? I got to own up to the fact that it's both. So I, you know, so I pray to find God inside myself yeah, um, and to find refuge in a Sukkot Shalom somehow. Uh-huh, beautiful. Beautiful, Donna, thank you. Thanks. It 
Harold, today. Please, are you there, Harold, or did I freeze? Just lost you, Harold. Right here too. Let's keep going, and if Laura is here, freezing. Okay, do you see the screen? Yeah, I see the beginning of Lori Crotman's piece. Hold. Sorry, there's some of my. So Harold, you might want to stop your video because that's what's taking up the most bandwidth. And then just do your audio. Mm. You might have left us. Can we take over the screen there or no? No, that's no. Um, yep, he okay. dropped out. Okay. He'll join back on in just a second. He'll join back on just a second. Um, so one of the things that you can be doing also whenever as we talk about is look for the words for enemies and look for the words for the opposite of enemies. So what are the words in the psalm that are about the attributes or the characteristics that are usually given to God because these psalms are ancient language of religion, but you'll hear me talk over and over again. They are there to give us aspirational images of what the best of humanity could be. So if we have the words for enemies, then we look for what are the words for good, whether they're justice, we've seen tzedek over and over again, or lishpot, judgment that is honest, or um, fortress for the, so always try and look in the Psalms for what are the words for that which removes uh, holiness from the world and that which puts holiness in the world. And those are the tensions that we saw beautifully in Dean's art pieces. Um, and we've also, and Donna just described, but that, if that's one way to look at the language of good and evil in the Psalms. Try and kind of almost make two columns in your head or even on a piece of paper as you look at a Psalm. What are the things that this psalm is telling us that's removing holiness from the world? What are the things this psalm is telling us increases holiness? Judy? Yeah, um, I'm looking at line six, but I'm curious in this where we have these really ugly words, but God's doing them to get rid of evil, like re um, destroy the wicked, blot it out. So how do you... Um, Th those are so, like when God. So, whenever, so whenever you're super uncomfortable with that language, no, no, no. But I, well, go ahead. But but you like justice, ethic, blah. You know those words. You know God does that. But in order to do that, He also does these other things. So I don't know how to fit that in. Maybe that's the theology. So there's a lot. We'll keep talking about this. There's no simple answer to it. The quick way to get to it, I think, is Harold back. Yes, Harold's back. Okay. No, we're Harold. We're having a great talk about good and evil in the world. Okay. Okay. No, no, no worries, but there's always room for talk about good and evil in the world. Yes, yes. All right, let me see so, if I can get the uh, sh screen shared again. How, am, how long am I going to be able to go without having a bus of congregants who can't go anywhere and I can talk on and on and on? I just miss that so much. You guys are the closest I come to that. I need that ability to just, you know, free associate. I need a captive audience, captive people, audience. Who can't get off really can people who can't get All off the right. bus, and I have the microphone. So hold on one second. Let me uh, let me pull this up. All right, here we go again. Is, did we find out, is Lori Crutman here today? Did she? Yes, Lori is here. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. That's Lori. quite all right. This is it's all, it's all meant to be. Lori, it's all you. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, I, 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 see a lot of these uh, psalms is the battles between good and evil. I, uh, that's such a recurring theme. And I always look at things um, from the outside and the inside because I fundamentally believe that you can always, you try, but you can't always change the outside, but you can, you can do something about what's going on inside most of the time. I mean, that, that's not so easy 
also. So that's kind of what this is about and what a lot of my poems are about. And I also had a conversation with uh, Sherry about the name. You know, I kind of felt that na bad names go away and don't have any power. So I used Ozymandias as, as my kind of bad guy <laughs> because well, if you know the poem by Shelley, uh, it's a wonderful poem. So, and and uh, Threnody, which I initially misspelled, is a, is like a wailing ode, and it just struck me that that's a, that was a that's what this is. So um, that's my process here. All right, hold on a second. I lost it. Uh, here we are. Okay, got it. Okay, a Threnody that ends in a murmur. Sometimes it's easy to bask in the magnificence of the world, to jump and shout and luxuriate in the earth's beauty. I want to believe that good eventually triumphs over evil, that love conquers all, that no one remembers Ozymandias. But can I wait for eventually? Should I join the war and smite the enemies? Ask something greater than me to make things right? I never really believed in that, so why start now? Why cry out to some formless, voiceless, ethereal being that I cannot see or hear or touch? Sigh. Fighting does not automatically include bloodshed. The battle rages right outside my window, in my room, in my heart. The newspapers are delivered every day with stories about forest fires, tsunamis, earthquakes. But deliverance is an inside deal. Nature eventually steadies itself by seeking equilibrium and balance is at the center of wall healing, even in the midst of extremes. Respond without reacting, with an open heart, without the spit of destruction, the only reply that has any power. Wow. <sighs> Talk to us a little bit more. No. Well, you know, one of my one of my favorite um, poems is called "Ali in Battle" by Rumi. Um, I'll, I'll post it on the on the on the yeah, Sam thing. Put that in the Facebook group. Yeah, I will. And um, you know, kind of the the bottom line, which I've always believed, is that there's all kinds of muck that goes on inside us. We have our own tsunamis and earthquakes and forest fires. We have them yeah. all the time, no matter what's happening outside, even on a sunny day. Um, and it's, it's like the dirt that, that goes, brushes around in the wind. Um, and if I respond to it, I do something about it. Like I can take them, I can go on a march. I can, you know, write letters to my congressman because I could, you know, kill an enemy metaphorically, but reacting is inside. And when I start reacting, then I'm lost. I, 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 I'm all merged in, in the bad stuff that's happening. So it, it's kind of like, a, I guess, um, people, that, it's kind of like a Buddhist or a Zen kind of thing to not react, oh. but just to respond without reacting. And that's a big deal to me. So that's what I'm trying to say here, no matter what, because we're all asking, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And Sometimes that often that leads me into despair, but I can always do something inside if I notice that I'm off and then I bring myself back down and and then I can help people. I, I can do what I what I want to do. <laughs> so that's basically what I'm saying. I think that's very powerful and the ability to have to even notice these things, right? Which of course is deeply Buddhist, but not just Buddhist. Juda Judaism, uh, I've talked a little bit about the Warsaw Rebbe a little bit. He has a famous book that he wrote before the, the World War II, which was Instructions on Teaching Children. And he said, and he says in that in a very famous thing about teenagers, he said, learning to control one's anger is one of the most important spiritual activities we have to do. And he says, you might not think it's possible to ever control your anger. But he said, just like a baby learns not to roll off the bed at some point. Like it's natural for a baby to roll off the bed. How does a baby, how, at what point do you grow up enough to know you can't roll off the bed? 
At some point you do, and you go from a crib into a bed. And the Rebbe says, part of what it is to become an adult, just as we learn not to roll off a bed, mm -hmm. we have to learn also to control our anger. You know, that we can have, that, and that it is as controllable as rolling off the bed. It takes practice, and we learn it, and it, then it becomes, first you have to focus, I mean, not the children do focus on it, but they, and then you learn, and then it becomes an instinct. And I, and I think that I believe that noticing, like sometimes we don't even notice that we're angry or notice that we don't notice it. And a couple of uh, sessions ago, we had a long discussion about somatic responses. Yes. And I think that's the first, you know, what's happening inside you or outside, you know, if a rash, your cheeks get red or your shoulders. Yeah. Tense. So it's often a, um, a good indication that you're off. Something's happening. Right. Because it's hard sometimes to notice it when you're off in your... When, you, when you're inside of it. Right. Which is, that's, the, that's the challenge, right? When we're inside of a historical disaster or inside of a personal falling apart, it's very hard to see the big picture. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. I think we have time for one more if Jeremy is with us today. Is Jeremy here today? Again, it's hard for me to see. Are we I am. Here? Okay, Jeremy, it's all you. Okay. Well, uh, this, this setting was inspired by Cantonimi's setting of Esma Chava Etsi Vom. I hope, Cantonimi, it's all right. I asked you, so but silence means a sense, so here goes. I think it's okay. Okay, here yeah. goes. I hope I make it through it. All of me is yours for all your wondrous deeds on this day. My heart sings to you. After all the years of pain, I am delivered. Praise be you who has heard my voice. Backward stumble all my enemies. You have found my verdict to be just. Caught these criminals must face your law. All their names shall be turned to dust. Dump from Pence and Bar, Chauvin, Kung Ling, Tao, all of them should live their lives in chains. Exalt the names George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brook, Mike Brown, Manuel Ellis, Eric Garner, Tamar Rice, Emmett Till, fight in the names, in the name of all the nameless. Hashem's justice is only now revealed. Gone now are all my enemies forever. All they were is leveled to the ground. Hashem, you sit upon your throne of justice and with righteous ways you judge the world. In your mercy you have not forsaken those of us who live in dark distress. Justice you have given to the humble who have sought your blessed holiness. King of heaven, I rejoice in your salvation from all those who revile your name, let all the wicked fall into the graves they dug forgotten there for all eternity. Master of all time with COVID, you remind us humankind is mortal, weak and frail, but never yet and never will there be a time when your compassion for us will ever fail. Never yet and never will there be a time when your compassion for us will ever fail. Wow, Jeremy. Fantastic, fantastic. The words, the setting, the chanting, the rhythmic nature of it. And I think you've, ex you've exemplified in here the power of saying the names and the power of uh, and the, the, this, re, the, this retelling of this psalm, I think, is, is really, really brilliant. Just beautiful and powerful, Jeremy. Thank you. And the presentation is just incredible. I mean, you get it in that, the rhythm of it and the building up to it and feeling the nechemta, the a time, never, never will there be a time when your compassion will, will ever fail. And the way you sang that, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Well, it was, it was great. Tell and, us about doing this a little bit. Well, I mean, this first, first of all, when I heard that setting, I I thought of the song. Uh-huh. And um, 
and that was one discipline, and the other was the acrostic. Uh huh. So um, I don't know. It just it, it was hard, and I wanted, you know, and, and I wanted to put in all the names. Yes. Um, some of the bad guys and as many of the the good guys because. If Black Lives Matter, I mean, say the names is to cry in the street. And so I'm saying the names here in this context seems very, seemed very important to me to take those names and put it in the Jewish context. Yes, I completely agree. I'm very moving. Very, very moving, Jeremy. Thank you. Well, and who knew, so Jacob Nimi, how who knew that the setting itself you chose, part of what is inspiring another expression is that particular setting. How beautiful that is, huh? Yeah, from, from El Nora Alila to Lech Basimcha to Psalm 9 to a new psalm. It's just beautiful, Jeremy. Thank you. I would love for that to be recorded separately, too, to be able to share that, Jeremy. Jeremy and I have talked about getting together when we can get together and do recordings of all the performances that you've done, as oh, we will that do would some be incredible. of uh, some of the others. So we're almost at time. I, I texted the rabbi. I don't know if she got my message. Not yet. We have no. a very special guest tomorrow morning who will be bringing us in with an exquisite musical presentation and here for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I'm not gonna tell you who it is. I'm not gonna give away too much, but if you wanna hear what some of the instruments mentioned in Psalm 150 might actually have sounded like, please be here tomorrow morning at the stroke of 10 for a I Try and get, you know, signed in a little early. Most of us do, but it's best if we're signed in a little bit before 10. Our guests will be starting at 10 tomorrow. So with that, uh, Cantor Nimi, I will put your text back up and you will sing us out? Sure. Okay, let me, let me reopen your text, hold on. Uh, and just a, a little bit of like an editorial note on, um, on this text, Kuma Elohim. Uh, Robert Alter has a beautiful uh, comment that there's scholarship suggesting that in Psalms 42 through 83, sometimes the word yud heh vav -he, Hashem, the, the four letter name of God is actually replaced with Elohim. So you could actually, if you wanted to, you could read this as Kuma Hashem, Shafta Haaretz. But Shefa said it with the original text, so that's how I will, that's how I'll sing it. Um, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Shovta Haaretz. Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Kuma Elohim, Shafta 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 Haaretz. Thank you, and I see that Leonard Phillip, who has been part of our class for 18 weeks, today's his last Psalms class because he has a new job and won't be able to attend. Uh, Leonard, thank you for being with us all these weeks. The classes are, are recorded, so if you want to keep following, you're welcome to at your time. And we're so happy that you were with us for all this time. Good luck with your new job. All right, everybody, see everybody. I'll be on at 9.45-ish tomorrow morning, and have a wonderful day. I'll report in on what CBST looks like.